All right, welcome back to part two on graphs. So we ended the last video talking about histograms and how we can clean them up and really learning a little bit about ggplot's code. Now I want to tell you what to focus on. So when you're making your plots throughout the rest of the semester, what we'll be looking for is the following. Okay. They should have X and Y axis labels. So tell me what the variables are on each of those axes. The use of titles kind of depends on the graph. Mostly won't use titles, but they're not improper, but they should at least be professional. Okay. Labels for that legend or a facet or any kind of other group marker. So if you have different colors, the graph should tell you what those different colors mean. Okay. And then error bars when appropriate. So when it's necessary to have some sort of error bar, it should include it. Okay. All right. And then cleaned up. So what do we mean by cleaned up? Well, I'm gonna show you some easy code that you can cut and paste. You can use theme BW or theme classic. Um, but what code that I'm gonna show you just like gives you a little bit more control than some of these other themes. So let's look at it. These are great easy themes to add to your graph for especially quick and dirty graphs. And over the years, I've kind of written a, a good number of GG plots and have used this exact code, only editing it when they've changed the rules for GG plot. And one key issue I've had is that the font size on these plots often prints out in something tiny and unreadable. And so we can change that using um, the theme command in GG plot. And I'm just going to save myself this block called cleanup that I can add to any graph that as long as I have that code in my markdown. So this cleanup code, what it does is um, it's a theme. So we're defining our own theme instead of theme BW, for example. I'm going to tell the panel grid major and the panel grid minor to go away. So element blank means turn that off. And these are the white lines that you saw with the gray background. Panel background, that gray background, go away. Now it's blank. So it's technically transparent. Axis line X, we're going to make that a black bold line across the bottom. Axis line Y, black bold line going up. The legend key, now this is really only important for graphs that have like a legend but we'll do a lot of those. <laughs> so we're gonna set that background of the legend key to be white. So traditionally the background of the legend key, like let's say you had a, a blue line, it would make that background gray automatically because the background of all ggplots are gray. Don't know why, but we're just gonna make it white. Okay, you don't wanna do element blank because then the element, the thing, the whole thing disappears, <laughs> the, uh, the rectangle for the, uh, marker. So we're just going to say in the background should be white. So it blends in with everything else. And then my favorite here, text element text, this controls all the text on the graph, make it bigger. Okay. You can kind of play with the size here, but 15 is, is usually pretty, pretty good. This also depends on the size of the graph. So if you print out kind of a small graph, it'll be really large. If you print a big graph, it'll be kind of small. So it does seem to scale with the dimensionality of the graph. So let's see, I've added my cleanup code. So this is our festival histogram that we were working with at the end of the last lecture. And instead of doing plus theme classic, I did plus cleanup. So here's what's happened. Okay. No gray background. And we've eliminated that. Want a solid X axis line, a solid Y axis line, and um, a much bigger font. And so if you took a break between these two videos, you can see that our font's gotten much larger. Right, much bigger. All right, so that's the end of histograms really and kind of the basics of a ggplot. Let's get more complicated. So let's move on now to scatter plots. So a simple scatter plot has X on the uh, an X, a continuous variable on X, <laughs> a continuous variable on Y. 
or for you guys, maybe this way. <laughs> a grouped scatter plot has X and Y variables that are continuous and a legend for our third variable. Okay. This is generally categorical, but it doesn't have to be. It can actually be continuous and it will color that graph based on that variable. And so let's import some data and get working with it. So I'm gonna import this anxiety and exam performance data. So we gave 103 students uh, a quiz, basically rate your exam anxiety. How much time did you spend revising your exam? So this is a take home exam. How well did you do on that exam? And gender. We'll use this data set again, several times this semester to really talk about continuous variable relationships. Gender is currently labeled as a continuous variable. So let's factor that bad boy. So on the graph, when we use it, it'll say male and female, instead of pretending like this is some sort of continuity between one and two. So I made my table first of all, saw that it's listed as one and two. Okay, that's no good. Factor, it's the name of the column. The actual, no, the, the what's in the variable now. And instead, what I want it to be, and then that has converted it from numbers to labels. Cool. Let's make a simple scatter plot. Okay. So I'm gonna call this scatter. Our first one is data. So the data is the exam here. X equals anxiety, Y equals exam. So now we have two variables in our aesthetic, X and Y. So put anxiety on X and exam on Y. I could flip those for this type of scatter plot. It doesn't matter which one I put on X and Y. To create that scatter plot, when you create scatter plots, they have dots on them. So do G on point. Okay. I could make the, uh, the dots all green if I wanted to, but we're gonna leave this a nice clean black and white. So G on point. Um, you can do color and fill in this as well. Our x-axis score uh, label is anxiety score, and our y lab is our exam score. I added my cleanup variable to it, and I get this nice scatter plot. So, what can I say about exam and anxiety? Well, I clearly got some people out here who, you know, variable variable on their exam, but B's, A's, right, one C, but aren't anxious at all. And then I've got a bunch of people who clearly are pretty anxious and their exam scores are all over the place. So this is not really totally lin linear in a sense, right? Maybe a little bit of a curve here, but there appears to be a lot of data at the top here and some data that might be outliers at the bottom or they're just lying. They say they're not anxious at all. I got this, right? Now I could try to add a regression line to this where I am plotting the linear relationship between anxiety and exams. Okay, and we'll talk about regression kind of the week seven or eight. Okay. To do that, it's, we added geom point here, okay. but we also added what's called geom smooth. Okay. Geom smooth smooths a regression line. Okay. And there are a bunch of ways to smooth, believe it or not, but we're gonna use method equals LM. Okay, and that stands for linear model. So draw me a straight line. And then I made the color of the line black and the fill of the line blue. Okay. So the color of the line is the actual regression line. The fill here is the 95% confidence interval of that prediction point. Okay. And so fill gives me a nice feel Bill gives me a nice understanding of how confident I am of each, of each prediction point. So let's say if our anxiety score is a 50, here's the range of, of exam scores I expect you to possibly make. So here's my exact prediction, and then here's a set of scores that I think might vary. So we've talked about confidence intervals before, and so this is the range we might expect the true population parameter. We're much more confident down here, even though you can tell the spread of the data is quite wide, but that's because we're, we're more confident in our score because we have more data down here at the bottom. So confidence intervals will always narrow where there are more points. Okay. 
just because, right, with more points, we have more sample size and the standard error, which the confidence intervals based on goes down. And so out here, it's really wide because we don't have very many points. But back to the ggplot part. So geom smooth here is we'll add a line to uh, two continuous x and y's. And in this case, you would want x to be your predictor and y to be your criterion variable, but we'll come back to more of that later. And so I would say there's a negative relationship between anxiety and exam scores. Okay, so as anxiety goes up, it appears that exam scores kind of go down at least a little bit. Now, uh, mainly if you leave out color and fill, it's black and gray. Big shock, <laughs> the default is often gray. <laughs> so that's how I add a regression line. Now, what if I wanna make a scatter plot that colors the different types of people? Okay. So we're gonna control um, the color and the fill and this time use a legend okay. and one thing you can do is control what those colors are. And to do that, you might use scale fill manual or scale color manual. And which one you choose is based on what you've used in your graph. So if you've used, if you've used fill equals somewhere, you use scale fill manual because they match. If you use scale color, if you use color somewhere, you use scale color. If you use both, you also use both. Okay. So if you have a color and a fill, you have to have then the corresponding color and a fill in the manual. If you want to control the colors, if you want to let them do whatever they want, you can leave this out. Okay. But the nice thing about scale fill manual and scale color manual is you can change the labels and the name in the legend. Okay. So name would be the title of the legend component. Labels would be the, the literal labels that like men and women. Values are what the color codes would be, blue, gray. Okay. You can also use hex color codes. So let's make a big old graph. Okay. So I'm gonna save this as scatter two. I've got my exam, okay. X and Y. So anxiety and exam, same one we did before. I now wanna color and fill by gender. I wanna do both because I wanna color and fill. So color the dots and the lines that we're adding and fill them both by gender. So if you only do one, you'll only get one. <laughs> So we wanna, wanna do both. Okay, so I don't wanna just outline them and I don't wanna just fill them in, I wanna do both. Let's see, what are we adding to this? Geom point to make it a scatter plot. Geom smooth to make it a line graph um, to add the line to it. But I didn't change the color here because instead the color is now determined by the variable. So you can't, uh, when you determine it by a variable up here, you tend to match with a scale fill. Okay. And so the reason I didn't put it in the geom smooth is because there's not one anymore, there's multiples. So I have to tell it that there are multiples. Okay. So that's kind of the distinction. When there's only one color to fill or one fill to fill, you can stick it almost anywhere. Right? We, put it in, we can put it in geom point, we can put it in geom smooth, Either way, when there's multiple colors that are dependent on another variable, okay, you wanna put it in your aesthetics okay, and then use the aesthetic markers to change the colors. Okay. So if it's up here in aesthetics, it comes out this way okay, to change them. You can leave them as their default. I think the default is blue and red. So they're, it's quite bright. Okay. Now, the name here is gender. Okay, so I can make the name pretty long. Men and women instead of male and female, because the data set says male and female, but now I made the men and women with the caveat that you should look at what order they're in when you are examining the data. Okay. They will come out in whatever order table prints them out in. So it prints them as male and female. And so it's very easy, I see people do this, to say, oops, my fault, sorry, to label this as me, women and men thinking you're just going to reorder them. No, no, no. That just relabels them. It doesn't actually change any of the data. So be sure this is in the same order as the data prints out. How do you know? Print out the graph without this part and then add it on top. So run just this portion of the graph and see what it looks like. 
values here, I made it purple and gray. So that colored the fill as purple and gray. Now for the color part, I did it men and women and made it purple and gray 10, which is a different color. And so that made my men grouping two different shades of purple. It will at least help you out with fill here. Fill is not complete. It's like a trans partially transparent. Okay. And then for women here, I got two different shades, one gray and one gray 10, which is very close to black. So now I've got my dots colored and my regression line colored. What can I tell from this graph? Well, it appears that the pattern of is the same for men and women. That's very close. Okay. There's not a distinct pattern for either group. And I could show that nicely with this data. Now with ggplot, try it, screw it up, rerun it. That's, that's kind of my <laughs> answer here. So let's look at what that graph looks like all by itself. So I'm going to come down here. And the nice thing about Markdown is I can now kind of scroll through where all those slides are. And let's go down here to group to scatter plot. Just going to tell it to run everything above this so we can get the data we need. Now, hey, make me that graph. Oops, I forgot to run this part first. There we go. Give me this graph. So without that cleanup code, uh, I'm sorry, with the cleanup code, but without my scale fill, what it does is it will automatically color these. It's kind of a green and a red. It's kind of like teal on my screen, which is probably not good for red, green, colorblind people. So that's why I'm spending a lot of time talking about how do I change the color to something viewable. Also notice that when I printed these in Markdown, the text is much bigger, but when I do the view, it's smaller. So you can change that text size in your cleanup to make these more viewable. Okay. All right. So that's how we can play with like, which one was first? Well, men, well, okay, now it's not readable. One second, <laughs> which one came up first? Well, it's men. So if I don't want it to say male and female, I can now add scale fill and scale color. What happens if you only do one? Huh? Let's see. Okay. So let's say I only did scale fill. It's not what you'd expect. It's gonna be great. It's my favorite thing. It actually separates it into two separate legends. Okay. So this one's for fill and this one's for color. Okay. We don't want that. You want one legend. So that's why you have to do it twice because you defined color and fill. So I have to do one for the color and one for the fill. And then when they're the same, it collapses them into one legend. When they're different, it separates them out. Other things you can do is move the legend around. So I could pick up this legend and put it up here at the top of the graph so it doesn't stick out quite so big on the side. That's an option as well. Now, an add-on package that we're that could be really good for scatter plots is G Galley. G G Alley. G Galley. I've never, <laughs> I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Okay. And it uses ggplot behind the scenes, but has slightly different code. And what I like about it is this GG pairs function that allows me to make a bunch of scatter plots at once. And this is actually a really great kind of quick data visualization for a lot of data. Now, not like 30 variables, but if you have four or five, like we do, we can quickly graph all of their relationships at once. And so what I do is um, it kind of gave me a little bit of a, some warnings here, but I said, okay, make me a GG pairs on my data. Okay. I dropped the participant ID because it's not a variable I'm actually interested in. And then the title, okay. nothing else. What it does is really cool. Okay. So the first thing you get here is each variable by every other variable. Okay, so this is revise and revise. Now, since this is back in ggplot, I don't clean, I haven't cleaned any of these up. I just want to show you the basics here. So it does make the ugly graph, <laughs> but revise by revise, well, that's a histogram. Okay, exam by exam, anxiety by anxiety. So those are the histograms of the data. 
Now, I'm not really sure what is uh, gender by gender here is a bar is a, it's still a histogram, but it makes it a little bar graph because we are, um, those are categories. Okay, so we've got equal numbers of men and women. Anxiety is negatively skewed. Exam, kind of negatively skewed. Revisions, positively skewed. When it has two continuous variables, on one side, it tells you the correlation between those two variables which we'll get that more into that later. So it gives me the correlation on the other half of the triangle here. So this is exams by revisions. So exams by revisions, it gives me the scatter plot. So that's really nice. So that's the exams by revisions scatter plot and that correlation is 0.397. Okay. And then for categorical variables, what it actually gives you is called a box plot. Okay, so a box plot is a, a plot of the, of the, the in, Okay, sorry. The bar here is the median. The white box part is the interquartile range, which you talked about as 25, 25 and 75, right? And then you get the rest of the data. So what we've got are these outliers here on revisions. So for gender, so it's gonna be male and then female. For revisions, we have some people who are way outside the norm. Okay. So box plots are sort of I think a violin plot might be a little better, which is a histogram, um, but on its side, a histogram on its side, so it looks like a violin, right? Uh, but I don't control this, but these box plots are nice because you can kind of see outliers a little bit. Now down here for the bottom half of gender, what it actually gives us is the histograms for each gender separately. So you can kind of see if the distributions by genders are different. So this right here, this plot gives me so many diagnostic pieces at once, it's kind of overwhelming. So it's really nice to kind of compare um, variables against each other. So it's a cool function, mostly for scatter plots, but then again, it also gives us box plots and um, which kind of show you the distribution of a data, of a data, of the data, uh, and not in histogram form. But, uh, you know, these two plots, I can tell men and women are pretty similar. Um, histograms and scatter plots. So done with scatter plots, let's move on to bar graphs. So with bar graphs, what I'm using is displaying the mean scores. So I'm compare, I'm using them to compare groups to each other. Okay. So this is where I'm going to have a categorical x axis and a continuous y axis. The error bars on a graph can be used to display the precision of the mean or the fit of the mean as a model, to go back to our earlier notes. That can be a confidence interval. That's what we'll do, like a 95% confidence interval. It's very popular. Standard deviations and standard errors are also popular. Okay. Generally, confidence intervals are two times standard error, approximately. So confidence interval, I think, is one of the most popular ways to do this, but you'll see all three. And so if you're ever labeling a graph, like if you're printing it for, you know, a thesis paper, you should tell people which one it is. So this, uh, you know, error bars represent 95% confidence interval because a uh, error bar could be one of many different things. Okay. And so for the median, sometimes people print the interquartile range. So tell people what your confidence interval is on your graph. Now let's say I have one independent variable, one categorical independent variable. So let's look at this chick flick example. We use this at the beginning of the lecture, but let's end with it. So we watched, we made people watch either a chick flick of Bridget Jones' diary or a control movie, Memento. And these are very different movies, right? And then we measured their physiological arousal. So we can measure like their skin conductance, right? Because the more excited you are, the sweatier your hands get. And um, we want to first make sure we convert everything to a factor variable or it'll be treated as continuous. And then sometimes if it's a character variable, ggplot will give you a weird error. Well, this was imported as an SPSS variable of data set. We've already fixed gender earlier at the very beginning when I was talking about how to factor. So let's now fix um, the movie. I can see that the numbers are one and two from my data set, or I could print out a table, and one and two correspond to Bridget Jones's diary or Memento. So a reminder, 
factor, the column of data, what's actually in the data, which is one and twos here, and then the labels that you want to apply to that in the right order. So Bridget Jones Diaries first, because that's what one corresponds to. Now, I have made my ggplot. So I have my data set. Here's x, here's y. And then now I'm going to add something new. So this stat summary function takes a the data set and calculates the value for you. So I could add g on bar, but I would have already needed to calculate the mean to tell g on bar where to put the bar. Okay. Instead, what I can uh, instead of calculating the mean and then adding a g on bar, I could use stat summary to just do all of that for me. Okay. And so stat summary is really great when you have the raw data. If you only have the means, you can use GM bar and tell it to plot, you know, one, two, three, four means. All right. So in stat summary, what we put is fun for function. We've seen that several times with the apply families, but the function here is calculate the mean. The geom that we want to print out is a bar. I could make this a dot okay. um, to have like a, a dot plot version of, of our graph. So you'll see these sometimes where they just have a dot and the error bars instead of the whole bar. I want to fill it white and color it black. So remember color is the outline, fill is in the middle and then clean that up. It's not a very good graph because we haven't finished cleaning up X and Y um, here, but we do have our two bars. So right away, I can tell that arousal is higher in the Memento movie. Now to add the error bars. So if you don't know what an error bar is, this is an error bar. These like crosshairs on it, so to speak. They're not crosshairs. There's a name for this. Whiskers. <laughs> Sometimes this is called a box of whiskers plot. We're going to use this code. Okay. So stat summary function of the data. So it's function dot data this time. Mean CL normal. So this is a confidence interval of the mean using normal distribution. The geom here is an error bar for this specific whisker shape. And if you don't include these two things, you're going to get something that is as wide as the bar and it looks really ridiculous. So try turning that off one time and seeing what happens. Okay. Position here and position dodge means that they're putting them on top of each other. Okay. I have, I can't tell you the number of plots that I've forgotten this on and it's like the bar is here and the error bars are over here. <laughs> so this position dodge thing means like, no, but really on top of each other. Width here controls how wide those whiskers are. 0.9 and 0.2 have always worked for me. I think this is book examples. This is what I always use, but try changing those and seeing what happens. Okay. What you'll see is the length of the different whiskers and the positions will just move around a little bit. But that puts the bar like right there, right in the middle. It shows us how much variance there is in that potential score, right? So this is the... Um, guess for the true population parameter. But I can kind of nicely show that these don't really overlap. Okay, they're the probabilities of their score, not the probability, sorry, the um, likely population parameter given the confidence intervals don't appear to overlap. They're very different groups. And then last but not least, I can clean this whole thing up. So now I'm gonna add my X axis label, my Y axis label, and then one more new thing here. But let's say I wanna change the labels here, just like the labels in a, in a scale fill and scale color like we did before, but I wanna change the labels on the X axis because we had them as Bridget Jones's diary and Memento. I could refactor my variable and rerun the graph. Or a function um, outside of the data, scale x discrete, because we want to change the scale of x instead of the scale of fill, because we're not filling here. And it's a discrete variable. So I'm going to give you two labels. 
And so the scale, anytime you're working with scale as a ggplot function, it maps onto where that scale is. So it's either scale fill, scale color, scale Y, scale X. So you notice it is tied to the aesthetic X, Y, color, fill. And here, since this is on the X axis and the X axis is discrete, we can say here are the two labels. If you try to give it three labels, there aren't three labels to give, it'll get mad at you. You can actually change the labels on a scale or a scale, a continuous scale, um, but it's a little bit trickier. Okay, so you can do scale Y continuous, for example, and we could change it um, to not break at 10 and 20. We could do 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, that kind of thing. That's just one variable. What about two? <clears throat> so let's say now I want to add the gender of the participant. So we've got these two, you know, a chick flick variable and a not chick flick variable, but I also have measured like what the gender of the, the person watching is. And that we want to separate really um, here. I'm doing it by fill. Okay. I could also do it by color, but in this sort of graph, it's just, it's easier to just do fill because there's no particular reason to outline the bar but I could also outline the bar <laughs> if you wanted to. So we didn't do color because we didn't want the bar outline. Okay. In the scatter plot, I did color and fill because I would need the line and the fill of the graph, uh, the regression line. Okay. So when you need each one kind of depends on the goals in the graph. If I just wanted to outline the bars in different colors, I could do just color or I could do both. So this is why I love ggplot. It could change it and see what looks better to me. All right, all of this is the same. Now let's use that scale fill manual that we learned a minute ago for scatter plots. And I just changed names, labels, values. And you have to know which one's coming first. So I know that male is the first one in my data set, like we looked at earlier. And so I just relabeled them for fun, just to show you how you can. So gender the participant boys and girls, and now we're revealing the data. Okay. So I could flip this where I have gender on X and film on Y. So what you wanna do, which one is fill, I'm sorry, gender on X and film on fill. Sorry, that's hard to say. What you wanna do is put bars next to each other that you want the direct comparison. So if you wanna compare men versus women within each of these sets, this is how you'd graph it. If you wanted to compare the, the movies directly to each other within gender, you'd flip them. Okay. So whatever kind of comparison you're trying to draw about the bars next to each other is the ones that you should put next to each other. Okay. And how you flip this is you just change uh, X and fill here. Okay. That also means you have to change X and fill down here, but you just kind of take those from, from film and gender and flip them. All right, so what am I revealing? Well, I'm revealing here that for, for guys and girls watching Memento, the arousal level is pretty even. Okay. It's up and it's even. But when we show them a chick flick, girls' arousal level appears to be a little bit higher, but their confidence intervals show that they overlap still. So I don't know that I think that these are very different, but they're at least a little bit different. Okay, we'll talk more about how I tell they're significantly different in a later chapter. Very cool, what are we gonna end with then? Line graphs. Okay, now line graphs are a take on bar graphs. These are not scatter plots with a line. These are specific line graphs. And here's when I would use a, a line graph versus a bar graph. So when X is categorical, but kind of continuous. Okay. So anytime you draw a line graph, you are implying some sort of linear trend. And so it doesn't make sense from boy to girl to show a line because there's no continuity there, so to speak. Okay. Uh, and more commonly, this is used with the repeated measures data over time. So you measured across time, but those are discrete points that I've measured at. 
So it should be a more discrete graph because I didn't really measure continuously for a scatter plot, right? I measured once and then twice. Um, but, you know, it, it is a time change. So generally, the, the, I call this mildly continuous, right? So things that do have some sort of underlying continuity, just for our purposes of uh, that particular uh, data collection, we've categorized them somehow. So like A, B, C, when it comes to grades, is continuous on the, in reality. We've just categorized them for that purpose. Uh, the example here I'm going to show you is actually not appropriate, <laughs> but um, just to show you how to how to make one of these work. Okay. So we could do success pre and post that Jiminy Cricket data. That would be more appropriate. But let's look at one more example of how to melt data. Okay. So let's say we have this hiccup cure. We're trying to get rid of the hiccups, which would be so wonderful in our house because when my better half gets the hiccups, I have to hide in another room. He has them for hours, okay? So let's say 15 participants who tried four hiccup cures and the dependent variable is the number of hiccups each minute after they tried their cure. Okay. So what we have here is one is Y data we've imported with our hiccups data set. And by Y data, I mean each row is a participant and each column is a different cure. So a different measurement, so a variable. Well, the first thing I got to do is reconstruct this graph such that there's one column for the x-axis and one column for the y-axis. The x-axis here is going to be the type of cure and the y-axis is going to be the number of hiccups. So now, hopefully now this example shows you why the data set has to be going from wide to long because there's no good way to tell ggplot like, oh, the whole, the whole, all four columns is actually y and then the column names are x. Okay. Instead, it's like, no, 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 just you restructure your data. Okay. One column for X, one column for Y. And many of our analyses also work this way. So that's why we started this lecture with Y to long. Okay. And so we need all these scores stacked up in a single column. So let's do that. Let's say melt hiccups. And I could actually stop there because there are no other variables, but just to make this super clear how this works, measured is all four of these columns. Now the long format version of this is variable and value. And so I renamed these column names here to call this intervention and hiccups because that's what those columns are. Now let's throw ourselves into a line graph. What you'll find here is that the line graphs look a lot like the bar graphs because that's what they are. They're bar graphs with a connecting line rather than um, the bar. So stat summary here, calculate the mean of each um, intervention and just give it a dot. Okay. Then calculate the mean here and make it a line. Okay. So this, this middle part's what's different. Okay, so calculate the mean, make it a point. So that gives us these points, point, 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 point. Now to play connect the dots, this is actually one of the hardest things in ggplot sometimes is connect the dots, <laughs> believe it or not. What we say is, okay, calculate the mean, make the, the connection between them a line. So between the mean points here, draw a line. And this here is uh, necessary for mapping the dot and the line together. Okay, so it says aesthetic group here, group is a, a, an argument equals one. There's one group, okay. no other factor or variable, just one group. Okay. If you leave that out, you'll get some wild lines will be doing whatever they want. Okay. Hmm. This thing adds those error bars. Okay. Notice we didn't have to do dodge okay. because we're just, they're not on top of the bars anymore. So we're basically saying just stick it right here. I think if you, I think if you can add dodge and it'll still look okay, but we're just saying, hey, the width is 0.2. X lab, Y lab, and cleanup. Okay. So the main key here is, is this one. So add a connecting line between means and there's only one group. And here's what we end up with. Okay. 
Now, this isn't really appropriate for a line graph because it implies that there's some like continuous trend here and that the trend is going down. But what I can tell from the graph, just looking at it, is that you know if you don't have them do anything, they have a lot of hiccups. If you have them pull their tongue, <laughs> you still have a lot of hiccups. Um, a car, like a massaging things gets better. And then their other category, which if you're reading the chapter, you'll learn about, um, it's not safe for work, uh, uh, is the best, okay? So we've got small confidence intervals. All right, what if I have two groups? So two independent variables. Okay. Let's do one more example to end this out. Let's say, is text messaging bad for your grammar? Hint. I have a degree in language, it's not, okay? But let's measure these children. So the children are split into two groups where they're um, between subjects. So some of them are allowed to text and some of them are not. Then in a second variable that's repeated measures. So anytime you hear repeated measures that involves melt usually. Okay? Each child is measured now and six months later where they're getting the text or they're not. And we've got some like grammar test to measure them. Okay. The new version of this, I guess, is does screen time ruin your children? <laughs> and the answer is no. Okay. So let's look at that data. So I imported my texting data. Notice that this data set's in Excel. Okay. So we've imported SPSS, CSV, and Excel files all in this lecture. And it's in wide format, so we've got each group, and then there are two measurement times. So if you hear repeated measures, it's in wide format more than likely, gonna have to convert. First problem, let's fix that factor variable. Okay. And how do I know it's one and two? Well, I'm gonna tell you. So anytime it's not clear from the imported data set, I will tell you in the instructions that one equals this, two equals that. Okay. And so we're gonna say, okay, factor that texting variable. It's one and two allowed and not allowed. Okay. Restructure that data so it's in long format. Okay. I'm melting my texting variable, keep the group, repeat like group needs to stay where it's at. And then our measured variables are the other two baseline of six months. And then I'm also gonna rename the, the columns, bleh, columns. Got, instead of group, variable, and value, I've got group, time, time of measurement, and grammar score. And so one thing I don't know if we made super clear at the beginning in our R lecture is don't use spaces and column names. Okay, we can change this later in ggplot. Don't use spaces and column names. It will let you, you should not do it. It makes you, it will make you very unhappy. Okay. Um, there are ways to use columns with spaces, but in general, much happier if you don't. So this is easily probably the longest one, which is why I use this as the example of stacking your code. It's much easier to see what each layer is going to be by having this stacked versus just running it in this huge line. Okay, so let's see what's happening here. We're plotting our long texting variable, the aesthetic here on the X axis is time. So this is a much better continuous variable example. Y axis is grammar, that's our dependent variable. We're gonna color them by which group they are. Okay. Now we shouldn't flip X and Y, X and color here because if we're gonna make a line graph, we want the X variable to be the mildly continuous one. Okay, or bar graph is better. Now we've added the dots. This is key here. We've added a line, but if you do group equals one, it will play connect the dots in a weird way because now Playing connect the dots depends on which group they're in. Okay. So you'll see here that group equals group. Okay. And that's not like just some magic mnemonic, like group equals one before it it means there's one group, just connect the dots. This here means group um, connect the dots because that variable is named group. Okay, if it was named cheese, this would be group equals cheese. Then we've added our error bars a nice X, a nice Y. And then I did scale color manual because I used color up here. Okay. 
So I said, okay, what texting it is. And then I just changed them for, to, to kind of show you how this is working. All of the text, so texting aloud versus none of the text. I made them black and gray. And then scale X discrete here, I just changed this to say baseline in six months. So I cleaned up the labels. Well, what kind of, what have I revealed in this graph? Well, looking at our, our measurement here, we've got our big error bar. So the groups start pretty similar and then they end and there's like apparently, you know, like maybe texting is killing their grammar, but there are so much variance in this var variable that their error bars overlap with each other. So they may not be different. We would have to do a statistical test. Here's another problem. Let's look at Y over here. So our mean grammar score runs from 50 to 70. So we should probably investigate the range of that data okay, to see if that is, you know, if that's just where the averages happen to fall or are we distorting the difference between these by keeping that Y axis so small. And maybe we should show you the entire range. Maybe this, the percent correct is actually from zero to 100 and this difference is actually quite small. And so that's something we'll talk about um, in a couple of weeks. We'll show you how to change the length of the X and Y axis. Okay. So let's summarize all this up. What have all we learned today? Okay. So in this lecture, what we've covered okay, is how to prepare your data for working with ggplot. So we talked about factor and we talked about melt. Um, some good ideas for visualizations, um, cleaning up all the x-axis labels, not using funky overlays, not making it a 3D graph, that kind of stuff. Then specifically, you talked about how to make a histogram, a scatter plot, a bar chart, and a line graph, which are really all the ones you'll need for this semester. Um, there are many more that you can make. So once you start to get into ggplot, we actually have a separate class specifically just on visualization. That, can, that covers this stuff. So there are many, many more like uh, forest plots are some of my favorite things to make where we can compare results from a lot of different studies, right? And so there are a lot of options here. And then we just talked about like ggplot has layers and how to get started. And then if you ever have just tons of ggplot questions, the easiest thing to do is Google ggplot2 and the tidyverse website is really quite great for this. And so it has a cheat sheet that tells you a lot of the different things and then has an unbelievable number of examples and how to change things. And so there's like an entire website just on ggplot um, that I use quite a lot when I can't remember things like, how do I add a label in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> right? So that function is geom annotate. So, um, the question isn't how it's, or the question isn't can you, it's how with ggplot. Okay. So we've kind of gotten you started on thinking about how you can structure that. It's adding layer, transparent layers on top of each other. So that's the end of our graphs lecture. And we'll use some of this stuff in our next lecture on data screening.